Welcome to Stop Making Things Pretty and Start Designing. If you want to hear about design stuff, you're in the right place. If not, there are you know, two other awesome rooms. But I'm glad you're here with me. This will be fun. A uh, little bit about me. Uh, my name is Michelle. I'm from the Chicago area, so I'm really happy to be here. It's gorgeous views out here. This is, this is beautiful. And uh, I do design uh, for print and web and also WordPress. And I've actually been kind of a design nerd my entire life without really realizing it. I started out, you know, on uh, doing like some little kid pics stuff and, and making designs. I've, I've been doing art. I've been doing layouts. And I, I kind of wind, wound up stumbling into this field and realizing it was perfect. Uh, I have a background in print design. That's kind of what I went to school for. I wanted to be a package designer. Uh, Chicago was a great place for that because, you know, it's a big package design area. And I was like, you know, that's what I want to do. I don't want to touch web design. I, I just want to do package design. So naturally, when I graduated college, I started doing web design. And uh, got into WordPress, and it's been fantastic. Now, one thing I've noticed uh, in my kind of course of this evolving design career is that uh, design has become more accessible than it ever has been. I mean, the design has kind of reached the masses at this point. We've got you know things like Apple and Ikea and Target making good design kind of accessible and well-known for everyone. But the downside of that is that there's kind of a little bit of a misconception about what design actually is. And so I'm going to get a little audience participation here. Uh, what is design? What do you guys think of when you think of design? Just shout something out. Organization. Organization. What else? Clarity. Interface. What? Colors. Colors. Right? Function. Function. Art. 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 Experience. Beautiful. Beautiful. Problem solving. Problem solving. Someone's been to my talk before. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been to your talk before. Yes. Good job. All right. Yeah, these. Don't have to think about yeah, it. Don't have to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> These are all really great uh, definitions of what design is. And these are all a lot of things people think about when they think of design. But I want to propose a new definition that's a little bit more comprehensive. Design both inspires and transforms an idea into a blueprint for something that adds value. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break this down a little bit as we go on through this talk. So let's start by talking about uh, inspiration, which is, which is the creative backbone, and that's kind of the part that we're all familiar with. It's the part that we all think of first when we think of design. So first of all, uh, design is an attention to detail. And this is usually the part that most people think of when they think of designers. Uh, this is what they spend a lot of hours teaching us in design school. This is what we put a lot of emphasis on is this attention to detail. And a good portion of this detail are the uh, fundamentals of composition. These are all the little details that make up a design composition and talk about its aesthetics and how it works. And uh, a designer is intimately familiar with all of these. Now, I'm not here to teach you about what all of these are. These are all just kind of some general principles that I had pounded into my head for four years, and I'll save you that. <laughs> Unless you want to be a designer, you don't have to deal with it. But these are these are some of the fundamentals, these are the details that we have to think about. But design is not only made up of fundamentals, design itself is fundamental. Design is not just something that's created with Photoshop or Illustrator or, or themes or glossy buttons, it, it's not just aesthetics. Everything around us is designed, and everything's design has an impact on our lives. Everything from the podium I'm using right now, the chair you're sitting in, everything, uh, the tablet you're using or the notebook you're using, they all were designed, and all of these things design has an impact on our lives. And this is because design is holistic. It's the big picture. It's greater than the sum of its parts. It's a lot of things put together. And there's a really good metaphor for explaining kind of how this works. So interior decorating shows are pretty popular. You know, everybody's pretty familiar with what that is. You can see it on TV almost any time. And what interior decorating is, is it deals with surface aesthetics. So it deals with paint and furniture and art and decoration. And what you notice about interior decorating is that there is some influence on form and function. You know, if you stick your couch in the middle of the room, it's going to be hard to walk around. And if you paint the walls a bright lime green, people's skin is going to look bad when you're standing in it. 
Well, what's interesting about interior decorating is that it's confined to the existing space. You're not really changing the space, you're just working within a space. That's interior decorating. Now, contrast that with interior design. Interior design is integrating not only aesthetics, but architecture and functionality. You have to have a fundamental understanding of the whole space. And an interior designer has to be able to communicate with multiple different kinds of positions. So they have to understand engineers, they have to understand architects, they have to be able to communicate with sculptors and artists and landscapers, they have to understand things like um, like the structural strength of things, metals and glass and different materials. They have, they have to have a much more comprehensive understanding of the space because they are creating the space from scratch. Like interior design, design in general is multidisciplinary. It has to be able to understand other fields because without understanding other fields, you don't have this holistic big picture approach that we just talked about. And in web design specifically, you can see this a lot, uh, whether you're an independent person or you're working as part of a team, you can see that web design has uh, kind of three branches. Uh, there's stuff that deals with what it looks like, there's stuff that deals with how it's experienced, and there's stuff that deals with how it's built. And you can see how it overlaps with several other disciplines, you know, uh, aesthetics, you know, you, there's a lot of overlap with illustration or art or branding on the marketing side. Um, the usability aspect of design, there's a lot of aspect of user experience, but also with psychology, with accessibility, and in structure, obviously there's overlap with development, but also content strategy. And in small projects, as an independent person, uh, the designer may be wearing a version of many of these hats themselves, but in large projects, the designer needs to be able to communicate with all of these other positions, and understand the importance of all of these fields. Design is the process of answering why to all the decisions that are being made. So it's not about how you do something, it's not about how it's being built, but why is it being done. And the next slide, I'm going to summarize my four years of college for you in one slide. I'm going to save you guys $100,000 right now. Best value ever. The most important aspect of design is being deliberate. All your decisions should have a reason. And do these decisions contribute to the goals of the project? There's a really good example of that um, in the mobile first thing that's going around. And we, we talked about that a little bit uh, with the keynote this morning, you know, designing for mobile first. It's a, it's a real world example of design thinking. Now I like to call it small screen first, you know, we don't need to make the assumption that somebody's being mobile when they're on a mobile device, I'm usually using it sitting on my couch being lazy because my computer's five whole feet away and that's just too hard. But it's a great example of design thinking because what's the real message of mobile first? The real message of mobile first is what are the most important elements, messages, actions, and content of your site and that's what we're giving priority to. Mobile first is just another way of saying be deliberate. And it's when you've started thinking this way, it's when you've begun to address the purpose of everything in your site that you are beginning to design. Now hang on a sec, I thought design was about making stuff look good. Isn't that why you paid all that money to go to design school? Well, yes. I mean, obviously, I, I do like attractive things. You know, I, I, I enjoy a good aesthetic, and I, I think making things look pretty is very nice. But things do not always need to be attractive to solve a problem. I mean, look at machines, like look at the workhorses of our, of our country, look at like industrial machinery and all of that stuff. It's not attractive in the traditional sense, but it is really good at solving the problem it was designed for. And I've got a few examples in here of some websites that are kind of the workhorses of the web world. First of all, Craigslist is a pretty good example of a site that has almost no aesthetic to it. It's just kind of there. Um, but it works extremely well. I mean, the hierarchy is pretty well defined. You know, you, you can find everything pretty quickly, and, and it works great. And wood being beautiful, wood adding a skin to it, wood adding some aesthetics to it, make it work any better? And I would argue no. It, it wouldn't really change how well it works. It might make it look nicer, but that's not affecting how it works. Another great example 
um, is the Drudge Report, which is a it's a site that it's a news aggregate. It just collects links and just you know puts it out there for people. Um, and it's pretty ugly. Like all it is is just pictures and links, and that's all it ever looks like. But it's got a huge audience, and would being beautiful make it reach more people? Well, no. People are going there for the content. Another great example is Google. I mean, Google's actually really not all that attractive in terms of what it looks like. I mean, it's, you know, it's super minimalist. Their logo is actually, it's different now. It's flat and a little bit nicer. But still, it's not a very great typeface. Um, but everybody uses it. And would being beautiful make it more widely used? And would it make it more trustworthy? Well, we've actually got a great case study for that because we've got Bing. Sorry, Microsoft. <laughs> Um, but Bing is beautiful in the traditional sense of the design world. You know, they've got the big images and the visually engaging content. But are people binging things? No, they're not. Great example of, uh, of the, this is my favorite, one of my favorite sites, uh, lingscars.com. And if you haven't been there, <laughs> go there. I mean, their mobile site is fantastic. And if you get a chance to look at their source code, do so. It's fantastic. This, this site is horrible looking, it's horrible looking, it's doing everything wrong, but it's actually doing everything wrong on purpose because it gets them a lot of attention. Would being beautiful make this site get any more attention? Well, no, it would look just like every other site, no one would talk about it. And clearly, it's working out for Ling because uh, she's getting a bunch of awards and she's, she's doing everything right from a marketing standpoint. Like this is, this is totally deliberate and this is solving a problem. And that's because design is problem solving. That's what looking for this why is doing. It's solving problems. Now it's also important to remember because we're solving problems that design is not for you. <coughs> what I mean by that is it's not for expressing yourself. It's not your personal taste. Design is not art. In fact, the only thing that design and art really have in common is that they're both working in the visual space. But art is about self-expression, and design is about problem solving. It's not about what you think is cool or interesting or cutting edge. And it's definitely not for winning design awards. It's not for designing for your peers. It's also not for your client. It's not about their personal taste. It's not about whether they want a photo <laughs> of a dog on their homepage or they like the color yellow. It's really for your client's clients. It's about solving the problem that the site was designed to solve. All of your decisions need to make sense in the context of the audience and the problem that needs solving. That is the context that we're working with. Otherwise, you end up with something like this. And this is one of my favorite XKCD comics, um, talking about things that are on the front page of the university website and things people actually go to the site looking for. And you'll see that one thing in common in the middle. It's very true. And that's what happens when you're not trying to solve your problems in context of what your audience is looking for. What we're really doing is we're trying to understand and interpret for our clients. And that gets us to the transformation part of this. So in this process, we're transforming some abstract thoughts and concepts into some concrete, <laughs> measurable deliverables. And this is kind of a little workflow how that goes. So you're taking some general feelings and you're developing some hard goals out of those feelings, and then you're integrating all of those with other external factors to form your design strategy. So what do I mean by this? Feelings, maybe something like our logo's ugly, or uh, we wanna do something different, or you know, I, I'm just not sure, something's not working, or you know, th these are feelings, and these are instincts that your client is having that something's wrong. <coughs> Might be a fear, or a need, or a worry. But these aren't things that you can measure. I mean, these are just these are just feelings. These are just kind of like an instinct that something's wrong. What you do as a designer is you turn those into goals, and you and you, you want to find the underlying reason behind those instincts. You know, and you do this by asking lots of questions, doing a lot of research, finding out about how their company works, how their space works, and you've got to turn those feelings with all this other knowledge into something achievable and measurable. Like we need to update our brand to reflect our new company values. That that's not my logo is ugly. That's that's something that you're doing, and there's a reason for it. 
And once you've got, you know, these kind of goals, you know, you, you take these goals, you marry them with kind of all the other external factors that are going on, stuff like budgets or other ideas in the space or what the customer needs, what the competitors are doing. You take all that stuff together and that builds your design strategy. And once you have the strategy, you implement that through the design process. And that is building the blueprint for project <coughs> implementation. Now this is pretty similar to the scientific method. It's kind of similar to the scientific method, the design process. And uh, for those of you that don't remember high school biology, I put it up here for you. Um, research, hypothesis, experiment, analyze, and report. I'm going to change some of these words around, so using some of the words that I've been using. You can see uh, research, strategy, implement, evaluate, and adjust. So what is that? You know, you can kind of see it's, it's very linear. You know, you've got your content and research, then you go into the design strategy, then you go into development, then you do testing and analytics. Uh, this linear progression is what's known as the waterfall model, which means that it cascades from one thing to the next. So, you know, you start with one, you finish it up, and then you go to the next one, and then you just totally finish that up, and then you go to the next one, and you totally finish that up. And in, in the linear model, as a designer, you're often working with stuff like this. So you're making wireframes, uh, you're building Photoshop mockups, you know, you're doing something, it's very literal, you finish it up, and you hand it over to the developer, and you're done. But is this the best process for web design? This worked really well in the print world, it was great, but does this really make sense for the web? It worked great in the print world because print design is, is like a symphony. Now, I'm a music nerd, I play the flute, so I'm going to make some music metaphors. I'll, I'll make sure to explain them for those of you that aren't, but uh, basically the reason it's like a symphony is because the symphony is well defined and it's played exactly the same way every time. So pretty much any orchestra or, or band of the same talent will play the song pretty much the same. There might be a little bit of variation, but basically the rules are there, it's spelled out, it's pretty, you know, it's the same experience every time. And print design has structure, it's got a very defined beginning and end, you know when it's done because you printed it, you can't really change it after that, and it's experienced the same way by everyone, you can control the experience. Now conversely, web design is like jazz. So jazz has a basic structure, there's some rules that you follow, you know, um, but there's a lot of improvisation, there's a lot of differences. It's never played exactly the same way twice. <coughs> and especially in a dynamic or content managed system like WordPress, the web is like that too. Because your, con your content's constantly changing, the environment that it's being viewed in is constantly changing, the type of device that it's being viewed on is constantly changing. When you do design, you do want to design with your content in mind, but it can't be abs absolute. You have to give up some of that control that you're used to in the linear print way and be flexible for future content. So this is actually a little bit more like what the design process is like. You know, content does inform design and design does inform development, but development can also inform design. Development can also inform content. Content can inform development. All three of them influence each other, and there really isn't a clear transition between them where one is finished and the next one started. And this is kind of uh, this is kind of what's known as the, the you know agile in development. And there's an agile design model as well that works very well with this. This is a specific interpretation of the agile model. It's um from a publication called The Strategic Web Designer by a guy named Christopher Butler who works at a company named Newfangled. I'm a big fan of Newfangled and I think this is a really great way of approaching this. The way you read this is you, uh, you proceed from left to right. That's kind of your time. But you notice that they're stacked on top of each other and that's because things are working concurrently. So how, how does that work? How, how can we do things concurrently? Obviously, communication is key. You have to communicate with the client. It's different from the standard process because you're constantly communicating back and forth as you're iterating. You have to collaborate with each other, not only design and development and content, but also any other stakeholders that are involved, you know, people like marketing, anybody else that's kind of got a say in what's going on. And you're constantly iterating. You're constantly changing and refining. So I'm going to go back to that other thing and kind of break it down into a few of the phases. 
Um, kind of this, this first half here, I, I like to kind of call the iteration process. So that's taking advantage of that design feedback cycle that we showed a little bit earlier. Breaking it down into a few more steps. You can see, you know, you've got your content creation. You've got uh, the development portion in the middle of it, and I'll talk about a little of this later. And then on the bottom, you've got what the designers are doing. So at the beginning, you notice something called a gray screen prototype, and this is kind of the collaboration between content and design and development all together, is working together on developing this gray screen, yeah, gray screen prototype. And that is what I like to call structure separate from visuals. So there's no visual element to it whatsoever. You're just talking about the structure of the site. And everybody's got a hand in producing this. And ideally in this method, a gray screen prototype would be interactive. So you know you can click on it and go through it, because static wireframes, it's really hard to tell how to use them. This is an interactive wireframe. It's not fully functional, so it's probably just built out in static HTML. It's not actually linked up to a database or anything. But that's what the gray screen prototype would be. It's a way of having a dialogue with the client about how the site's going to work without talking about what it looks like. Concurrently with this, a uh, designer would be working on something called style tiles. And if you've seen uh, an interior decorator's mood boards before where they've got fabric and photos and stuff, it gives you a sense of what something's going to be without actually literally being that thing. And I call this, if gray screen was function sep separate from form, this is form separate from function. So now we can have a discussion about what it looks like without being obsessed over whether we want to move that social media button five pixels to the left. We're just talking about the look and feel, and it's kind of cool. So after the style tiles are approved, what would happen in this method is that the designer would then go to style guides. And this is something that's very helpful in terms of um, providing information to the developers for development. Uh, the designer would be putting something together in CSS and you know, giving instructions to the developer, more, more literal interpretations of how things are going to be. This is just an example. It can be a lot of different things. And after this, then the designer would go and design specific graphics, so whatever assets are needed, whatever photos are needed, that's how that would work. During this time, while the designer's putting all this specific stuff together, the developer is working on a white screen prototype in this method. And a white screen prototype is a fully functional version of the site, so it's actually doing everything. The only difference is that there's no skin on it, you know? There's no CSS, it's just, here's the site actually working, and it gives you a chance to test that out while the designer's working. So after this iteration process, you hit sign off. And pretty much this is when you're done with iterating on the design, and you're done with iterating on how the site works, and then you execute. <coughs> and execution, you know, at that point, you, you've got your design approved, you've got CSS, you've got some instructions, you've got your white screen. It's really easy to combine them together and put your content in, and then start doing, you know, your quality testing, and then you add everything, and you test and launch, and then you're just totally done. Right? Well, no. Okay. <laughs> because then you have to go back and test your hypothesis again. You have to do analytics. It's a cycle. And I, I look at it, I kind of made this up, but I think of it, there's kind of two ways you can test it. There's kind of the technical testing where you're doing analytics and A-B testing and UX testing and all that stuff. But there's also more of like an ecosystem test. So you know, you're getting surveys and feedback from people, um, you know, is your integrated marketing working? You know, is this still the goal that you're trying to pursue? You're reevaluating the whole ecosystem around your design, and then you, you know, you start over again. So what is this all for? That is a whole lot of work. Why are we doing this? We're doing this because design adds value. That's why we're here. We add value to the client by working with and elaborating upon their business strategies as a partner. And it's adding value to your business because you're elevating your status from just a vendor who executes on things to a trusted advisor that's collaborating. So stop thinking of yourself as a pixel-pushing monkey. You're not just executing on what other people tell you. You're not just a low-value vendor. You as a designer are a trusted partner, you're a business partner, you are a collaboration of experts in your respective fields working together. So how do you get started? On all projects, big or small, and that's whether you're working on a project with a huge team, 
or whether you're a, an independent person. You can, you can use all elements of this in your own work. I mean, for me personally, as a freelancer, I, I don't often get the chance to work with a team. So if I'm working on my own with a client, you know, we'll, we'll select a starter theme as a place to start, and that kind of works as my, my white screen prototype. We've got kind of a working version of the site without their brand. And meanwhile, I'm building the style tiles over here. So even though it's just me, even though I don't have a huge team of people that can do all this testing, I can still implement some of these, some of these processes into my own work. And obviously, um, the field is always changing, so, so keep learning. This is actually my bookshelf, which is like 10% of the books that I own. Um, and there's always more resources when you're learning. Not only are you learning how to do things, but the more you learn, the more you learn about why you should be doing things. And it gives you a lot more to be able to share with your client. I've got a, uh, like a non-exhaustive list here of cool resources. You don't have to write all this down, because I've got my slides up. But uh, these are a bunch of different resources that you can have for doing, you know, learning more about design as a process. I personally like to purchase books that are about theory uh, and read online things that are about how to do things, just because how to do things keeps changing. There are a lot of great books on how to do things if you really like dead trees. And I understand the appeal of dead trees. I have lots of books. But uh, that's kind of how I broke it up. So in conclusion, uh, stop making things pretty. Start designing. I have some time for questions, a little bit of time. Okay, there's a mic. Questions? <laughs> Who had a question? Yeah. It's not really a question, it's kind of an addition to what you're saying. You're talking about design being a problem solving, but I think before you can solve a problem, you have to define it. So problem definition is a big part. And not just accepting what your client says. Yeah, problem problem definition is a big part of it. And for me, that's part of the, you know, when you're getting back to why, you know, if a client says, I, I want this site to do this thing, you can be like, well, why is that? You get you, you know, you get back to the source of why because they, they're not web you know, they're not web designers, they're not web developers. Yeah, they're not you know, they're not what you are, and so you can help them. They may be saying what they know, but you can help them find out like what's really going to solve their problem. So that's a very good point. Any other questions? Right. <laughs> Microphone. Right here. Put your hand up. Yeah, you gotta like oh. be excited. <laughs> Many years ago, I had a design firm, and the biggest problem was um, convincing people that design wasn't just making. I'm just wondering, in your experience, especially for smaller clients, are the clients more sophisticated about understanding that design isn't just making it pretty? Like, I hate using that word in anything I do, you know, make it pretty, to make it work. Um, so I, I'm just asking if the clients and people are more sophisticated about buying design. So are our clients more sophisticated about buying design? I would say it depends on how you start the relationship with them in the first place. Now, obviously not everybody is going to be a good client. There's some people that you just can't convince to do anything, whether that's you know spend the right amount of money on a service or feel that something has value, and not everyone's going to be a client. But for those who you feel you know are going to be a good match as a client, for me, it has depended on how I start the conversation with them in the first place. So I. I take them through and I kind of explain the process. And I used to work at an agency where, you know, it was not managed that way, like the expectations weren't managed that way, and I often wound up just executing on, because I was not in a position of power to really question that, but I often <coughs> um, wound up just executing on whatever they wanted because the customer was always right. And I found that by, by starting the discussion differently, it helped a lot. But not, not everybody's going to be sold on it, just like not everybody's going to be sold on why they need to pay more than $500 for a website. And that's okay. To actually help with that particular piece, because I work with business owners and web designers, so I'm the middle person. If you take it away from the business owner going, I know that this is your business and you are proud of the way it looks, however, your customers are coming to your site for a reason. 
And that reason is what needs to be the prominent, not necessarily the image of your company. Right. So basically, for those who didn't hear, like you have to you have to remind people that there's a reason why they came to you. Which goes as back an to expert. your functionality. Yeah. Of and I, I like to call it, and then this is part of the conversation I have. Like, we're both experts in our respective fields. Like, I could never do what my client is doing. I, I couldn't do it. Like, they are so great at it. And if we both respect each other's kind of knowledge, that really helps. Like, I'm collaborating with you. Like, I know this thing. You know your thing super awesome. Like, let's make a cool thing out of that. Where we both know all this cool stuff and we can put it together. I'm a small web, uh, web designer and developer, and so I'm kind of wearing both hats. And I have small clients, a lot of them with, with small budgets, and um, a lot of them bought at the price I want to give for, uh, say, an interior designer who has no idea what um, a website costs, should know, because she's a designer and probably charges her clients a lot. But still, um, when you get to the price discussion, there's always like, oh, how can we cut the price in half? So I'm always going to, well, I could cut out the design phase. I can make it very, you know, basic. And so many people are happy to go with that. But I don't think I'm communicating well enough um, what design is with my clients. And this is been helpful. Sure. So um, in terms of when businesses don't have a lot of budget and they want to to cut things down and you know for me actually too it's the same way with my smaller small small budget clients the first thing that goes is custom aesthetics I would say so the, the custom template the custom theme um, but still you are providing a design service to them even if all you're doing is helping them pick the right starter theme and because that's part of it you know that's part of it too you're helping them find like if they can't afford a custom theme, you're helping them find the starter theme that will work to solve their problems. Like that's still design. I mean, I've I've got micro clients that I'm just like, you get 10 hours of my services for 10 hours flat, and and however it makes sense to use those 10 hours to get you set up. Like usually for really small like super startups or nonprofits, they don't get a custom theme. I will help them do the research based on my knowledge to find a starter theme that will get them to that point. I'll help them configure everything. I'll help them set up. That's still, that's still design. It doesn't have to be custom aesthetics to be designed. I guess I'm like I'm really super pragmatic about it. Like I love everything to be custom and super pretty and awesome, but not everybody is ready for that at every point. So don't don't feel like you're selling yourself short just because you're not building something custom to them because your knowledge is still being put to use. Yeah. Clients buy into the definition of goals and then afterwards the proof that you met the goal or that they happen or that if they block off most of what you're trying to persuade them to buy, that that affects the outcome. The clients that I have personally worked with, I think it's just because I'm getting referrals from other clients that, like, I, it's kind of a snowball effect of, like, I've got a good client that buys into what I do and they find other people that also buy into what I do, so I guess I'm lucky. Um, I mean, that's always something people struggle with, so I can't really say that I'm a genius of convincing everybody that I'm always right. If I was, that'd be sweet. I could be a dictator. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's, that's something everyone struggles with, and I don't have a magical answer for that. There's lots of... I, I'm not new to uh, print design or web design, but the whole responsive design, uh, I think trying to reconcile that as I'm creating concepts, and I generally start with the concept and work on the copy and then work on the design. So I already have all these things going on. And putting together a traditional website, yeah, that's fine. And then thinking about it in terms of being on the iPhone and being responsive with iPads, it just kind of is hard to reconcile all that. And I was wondering if you have a process for that. Sure. 
um, in terms of a process for working responsibly, I've actually got another talk that I give to designers specifically as an audience about how to work better with modern web processes, um, responsive being one of them. And the biggest thing is like it is the opposite of what they teach you in design school. It's 100% the opposite because in design school, it's very locked down. It's very about control, and responsive is really about letting go of that control in terms of what it looks like, and uh, and putting the content first. And I think the keynote this morning was a great description of that uh, about what responsive is is. Um, is putting content first and really letting that dictate how things are going to be. And it's not even about like here's my iPhone design and here's my tablet design because who knows what like smart watch or smart refrigerator or like smart dog food water bowl we're going to have in the future that we're looking at the internet on. But again, going back to that, like what is the content? What's the most important thing? And kind of growing it from there. It's 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 very different. I. I still struggle with it because, again, it's like the opposite thing of everything I learned and, and getting your brain around that lack of control is, I guess, one of the most important things. Are we done? Oh, one more. Uh, it's a nice um, uh, design question, more like a business management question, but I am having difficulties with clients. You know, I consider the site is done and they haven't signed up for, um, for an ongoing maintenance. But I still get the phone calls like, okay, I don't know how to do this and how to do that, and you know, I just messed it up. I do, you know, at the end, I gave them a training on WordPress. So I just don't know how to deal with these clients. So because it's probably ten minutes of my of my time, but if it's ongoing and I feel like, you know, it's just a phone conversation, but it could be much much longer. What? would be your recommendation. Okay, so a, a business management question on um, kind of how to deal with ongoing client requests, even if they're little things. Um, now, and there's a lot of other great people that you can talk to about business management besides just me. What I personally do depends on the relationship I have with the client and whether I want to keep them as a continuing client. I, um, I do build in like a month or two at the end of like if something breaks or if there's something weird, like totally feel free to give me a call. I, I give people the option of, of reaching out to me, and, and I'm not afraid to say, if it's kind of beyond that period, like, hey, this thing you asked me for, like, it's actually a little more than two seconds of my time. Like, if we want this, we can talk about maybe a little mini project to, to deal with that. For some clients where I get a lot of ongoing work with them, you know, I, I might be more lenient. Or you can always talk about, if it's something where you just have constant requests, constant requests, you know, set up a, a monthly retainer. Like, set that up and just say, hey look, you've asked me X amount of questions this month, like that's a lot of that's a lot of my time and you know I respect your time, whatever. So it's a that's a very good long it depends answer. But there's a lot of other great people to ask about that. I'm sure you'll get different answers from everyone. So I think is that it? Everybody wants lunch? Yeah. <laughs>